Thank you, Mr. Nick. I appreciate it, and I uh, appreciate all you guys showing up today. And hopefully we can give you a, a little insight into HF amplifiers and how simple and complex they can be. <clears throat> Everybody, you know, looks at uh, an HF amplifier and they get real standoffish. You know, the first thing they say is, boy, this thing looks uh, really complex and hard and tough to deal with. Well, there's only one real thing that you have to be careful of, and that's high voltage. It will kill you. And if it don't kill you, it'll hurt the hell out of you. Believe me, I can tell you from experience. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at in the beginning here is um, this is a basic diagram. It's not a real good picture. That's my fault. This is the old days of a 3-1000Z, single tube. It was the big brother to the 3500s, which everybody, everybody and their brother used. Heathkit, uh, Drake, um, Swan, you name it, everybody had a 3500. Even the Hunter Bandits, they had 572Bs and then they came out with the 3500s. They were cheap back then. Um, I believe when Heathkit was in business, they were like $35 a piece. This tube here was about 90 bucks, you know, and it was the big brother. It would do uh, 2KW easily. It would take 6,000 volts on a plate if you wanted to push it at 800 mils. So you could do quite a bit of power out of this thing if you really wanted to push it. There were a few commercial amplifiers built with it. Uh, Henry built, uh, not Henry, uh, oh, it's uh, Harris. <coughs> RF Harris built one, uh, BTI built one, which was exclusively for the hams, and it was to complement that Collins S line you see right there. It was the <coughs> floor model. It, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it uh, was to compete with the 30S1, which Collins was building, and of course, when you said Collins, you said a lot of money. So. To get started, this tube requires very little. <clears throat> you've got the tube itself, you've got a filament transformer, you've got a choke, you've got an input coil, which really you don't have to have. It's good engineering practice to have it, but it's not necessary. Ah, thank you, Mr. Nick. All right, I'll give you a rough rundown, about 16 parts. The tube, plate cap for it, socket, chimney, Filament transformer, filament choke, plate capacitor, tune capacitor, coil, band switch, <clears throat> plate choke, you know, and uh, SO239s, and some decoupling caps for the, uh, for the plate. So in, in essence, what you have is very few moving parts, if any. You know, you've got a tube, and that's the only active component in the whole unit. So this is a very simple and straightforward amplifier. It has no frills. There's no grid protection. There's no plate protection. You know, there's no blower protection. So, you know, you have to kind of do your due diligence when you're using an amplifier like this because there is no overload protection of any kind. So, you know, <clears throat> this worked fine in the beginning when everybody was home brewing and it was cheap, cheaper to build than buying a commercial amplifier. So you could hornswoggle a tube, and back in the days there was 4 1000, which was <clears throat> a tube that was widely used in broadcast. And if you grounded the screen on it, it became a grounded grid amplifier. Didn't work as good as this one, didn't have the IMD. Uh, characteristics, but it was close enough for government work back then years ago in the 60s. So, you know, the next thing we move along to is, well, we got to find some way to power this thing. So, here we go. This is uh, your whole thing in a nutshell. You got a transformer, you got a bridge rectifier, you got eight capacitors, or ten, depending on the voltage, and you got some bleeder resistors, and a few other resistors and a switch to turn it off and on. So this could be built in an afternoon. There would be no problem in sitting down, placing the components on a piece of cardboard, getting them all lined up, 
and then transferring that to a chassis. Now you could do is bolt it together and wire it in. So in a weekend, you could build a good power supply. And then you had an amplifier. So in two weekends, you could possibly build you an amplifier that would save you quite a few bucks. You know, you bought an amplifier back then, you were looking at $1,000, you know, <clears throat> and it was big, it was heavy. You had to ship it, you had to go get it. So it was, uh, you know, it was a way to save a lot of money. And most people homebrewed back then. Nowadays, it's kind of a lost art. There's a few of us left, but there isn't many. <clears throat> so now when you look at the schematic, you go, well, gee, you know, there ain't a lot to it. And there really isn't. <clears throat> and even to make it simpler, all of those capacitors and those bleeder resistors could be reduced to two components. An oil fill capacitor, which get a good view right there. Those are two oil fill capacitors. So those take care of the capacitor. You only need one of those because you're not drawing an enormous amount of current. And then what you've got, if you look on the left hand side, this is a string of bleeder resistors. So <clears throat> those are 100 watts, but you could put a 225 watt. So now you're down to one resistor and one capacitor, which makes it pretty simple as far as building goes. And you don't need a lot of sophisticated tools, a couple of hole punches, a drill, and you're on your way. Now, this is all fine and dandy, but nowadays, now we got a different world. Now what we've got is we've got solid state radios with microprocessors. And everybody wants to hit that button and I'm on frequency. I don't have to tune anything. There was no, if you look back here, you got a plate tune and load control on this. You got a pre-selector for the driver. You know, all of this stuff had to be adjusted when you change frequency. Well, same with this. With this amplifier, that's what you had. Your plate and load capacitors here. This was your tune and this was your load right here. So anytime you move frequency of any significant amount, you had to readjust these. And that was fine back in the day because everybody was used to doing that. But nowadays, a uh, whole different world. Nobody wants to have to do all of these menial tasks, you know. So <clears throat> with that in mind, oh, I guess about two or three years ago, I stumbled across a cabinet, which was a Henry 4K Ultra cabinet. Guy bought it 10 years, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Was going to build an amplifier in it, never did anything to it. They said, man, I want to get rid of this. It's just taking up room. I said, okay, I'll take it off your hands. So I picked it up, and it sat just like he did. You know, and one day I said, you know, it sure looks nice. I think I ought to build something in it. So I sat down and looked and I moved stuff around. I said, man, I, maybe I'll put a pair of 8877s. Ah, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I said, I've done that before. Well, I said, talk to my buddy Nick. I said, Nick, you still got that 3CX3000 we got from iMac as a uh, engineering sample. He said, yeah, I still got it. He said, you want to come get it? I said, okay. So I went over there and picked that up. And lo and behold, I started building a chassis. I got, uh, I have a friend of mine who has a sheet metal shop. And as you can see, sheet metal all uh, looks pretty good. And I said, well, let me look and see how I can make this thing so I don't have to tune it. Tune it one time, adjust it, set it, and I'm done. So I said, well, I need roller inductors. And then I looked at the Henry 8K, and it used a fixed tuning cap plate capacitor. No tuning on a plate, so you tune the inductor instead of the plate. So you pick these capacitors to give you a Q of about 12 to 15 in the middle of the band that you're going to be on. You take these, and now you got to switch these in and out. As you change bands, those have to switch. So what you don't see here, and I haven't finished, is along the front of this tube, there's going to be like five vacuum relays, which are going to pull in fixed values of doorknob capacitors. So when I change bands, as you see on the front panel, 
that's 160 through 10 meters, including the walk bands. You punch that button, it's going to pull in a group of relays that it needs to pull in. Now your plate capacity is set. Now you say, well, that's good, but you still got two knobs in the front. That's in case you want to go to manual. In automatic, what will happen is these two inductors will go to a preset value for that band. And if you're on CW, there's a CW light on the front panel, and there's a sideband light. When you're in a CW portion of the band, that CW light will be on. When you go up in the sideband portion, the sideband light will be on. And <clears throat> I have thoughts of making them different colors so that there will be different segments. So I can punch 80 meters once, and I'll get a green. 80 meters twice, I'll get a blue. And this will be different segments of the CW portion of the band. Same thing with the sideband portion of it. Well, you know, in order to do this, you've got to have some pretty sophisticated circuitry to do it. And that's a bottom view of the amplifier chassis. You can see the, there are two motors, and those are stepper motors, and there are two controllers on either side. There's the two stepper motors. And I figured that stepper motors would be the easiest way to do. They'd have repeatability, you know, and I said, well, you know, Every time I turn the amp on, I'm going to let it go to a preset value. And, you know, once, once it's at the preset value, it knows, knows where it is. After a while, I got to thinking about that, and I said, you know, not really a good idea. I said, what's going to happen is you're going to wear on both the inductors and the tuning capacitor. You know, you can be moving those things every time you turn the amplifier on and off. I said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do that. So I said, well, let me think about this a little while. So I came up with this little gadget right here. And this is going to couple to your stepper motor and it's going to adjust. Well along the back here there's also going to be a potentiometer. So this potentiometer is going to always give you a spot where you are. So when it turns itself, when you turn it on, that little microprocessor board which is right here is going to be able to say, up, oh, you're on 80 meters, boom, this light's on. Oh, you're on the CW portion, the CW light's on. And you know, for the for microprocessor, it's child's play, nothing to it. <clears throat> so now that this little board comes into play, this will send pulses to both motors in order to move those inductors and there's also a load capacitor that I don't have in, which is going to go right in line with the tube and up toward the top of the amplifier. That is also a vacuum variable, and it's going to be adjust the load and those two inductors. What you see there is what's called a PIL. There's your first inductor here, and if you'll notice, there's a band in the back, a little serpentine belt that drives the second inductor. So as you rotate, one, both move. So this gives you an extra 10 to 15 dB of suppression over a Pi network. That first amplifier you saw was a strictly Pi network. Input, output. This one, adding that second coil, gives you a lot more harmonic suppression than you would normally get in a regular Pi network. And, you know, years ago, that was really a benefit because we had TVs, you had two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and somebody always got some TBI. You know, that was just a given. So <clears throat> the Pi L was incorporated to get rid of any extra harmonics that might be there or bring them down another 10 to 15 percent, which everything helps. Nowadays you got cable, you got satellite, now all you got to kind of worry about is getting in somebody's IF or getting into the stereo. You know, so it's not as critical as it, as it once was. So this little micro, and, and we'll, look, we'll look at the power supply right here before I get too far ahead of myself. That is a transformer that I picked up off of QTH.com, which was out of an 8K Henry. Henry makes... Uh, 
an 8K, and this guy had one at one time and had spare parts for it. He had that, the filament transformer, you know, up on uh, QTH, and looked good. I said, okay, I'll take it. He sent it to me. At that time, I had no idea that it was going to go in this cabinet. So when I, you know, I got this cabinet and started looking at it, and I said, well, let me, let me set this transformer in there and see just how it's going to fit. Well, lo and behold, Henry drilled more holes in these chassis than you can imagine. And the reason behind it was because they used the same chassis for many different amplifiers. So lo and behold, the holes were drilled for the transformer. So I said, hey, voila, this is a perfect fit. I said, we're good to go. Next, you'll see down here at the bottom, down here, that's the diode bank. That's eight amp and a half 15 kV diodes. Those, again, came off of eBay. Somebody had a parcel of them for sale. And I said, can't pass it up. So in the junk box they went. Now I'm uh, building this amp. So out they come and into the amplifier they go. You will notice up at the top, we have a little vacuum relay. There are two high voltage taps on this transformer. One was high power, the other is low power. <clears throat> So in a, in, in a lot of the Henry's, they use a switch in the front panel, which actually selects that. I said, you know, I just don't want to run 2,500 to 5,000 volts up to that switch. I'm going to put a vacuum relay, and now I can use 26 volts to switch to high voltage. So that's how that came to play. And those five or six switches you see at the bottom those were added. That's not part of the Henry uh, amplifier. I looked around for a while to find something that was close. I tried to find the original CompuLite switches that went in there. Well, that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. <clears throat> they were out of California, probably close to where Henry was located, and they are very difficult, if not impossible, to find. So I did some snooping around, and Oak had made some switches, and I found those, and that's how those became part of the front panel. I tried to keep the front panel as clean and as neat as I could. And you have your plate current meter, your watt meter and tuning meter, and, of course, your multimeter, which does your filament voltage, plate and grid current. You know, So at this point, I said, well, I need to wire that front panel up, and I wired it up. And lo and behold, I found out that they went to a DB25 connector, which is anybody that's got a computer in the old days knows that was a printer connector. So I said, well, I guess that was the best of both worlds for them. And luckily enough, 25 pins was enough to get all the wires from on the control panel to the bottom. And I think you can see right there, Neck, that cable that's going across has got a DB25, and that plugs just about directly up here. There is a, uh, that's where the connector from the top resides. So that brings all your control cables from the front panel to a terminal strip that's on the back. Right there, you'll see those two terminal strips that are on the back. So all of the front panel wiring now comes to these two terminal strips. And you can wire all the rest of the stuff that needs to be wired. Your uh, filament transformer, which is going to have your, it's going to be a 220 transformer. And that on the side is a little switching power supply to give you your 28 volts, which is going to be your control voltage for this. Everything in this amplifier, with the exception of this board, runs on 28 volts. All the controls, all that, re that vacuum relay you saw, and everything that's going to be driven is going to be driven off that 24-volt supply. Now, this right here is the heart of that amplifier. This is what's going to do all your moving and shaking. It's going to change the lights on your band switch. When you push the button, it's going to tell this, up, want to go to 80 meters. It's going to instantly move those two motors, and it's going to set you up where you need to be in inductance. And it's going to move the load capacitor so you know where your load's got to be. And it's also going to trip those relays that are going to switch in 
those fixed capacitors for your plate. So that is going to be, in this board right here, everybody, you know, and I'm the first guy to tell you, computers are really a pain. But this is a little PIC controller. It's a microcontroller. You program it with BASIC, which is just about everybody at one time or another had some dealings with BASIC programming. You know, it's, it's simple. It's easy. I built uh, a coil winding machine, and this was my dummy prototype for using one of these boards to control a uh, stepper, actually two stepper motors, one to wind it and one to move the wire over. And I got tired of unplugging and replugging and unplugging and replugging, so I put this together so I could change the programming in this, and I could see just what it was going to do right here before I put it into the uh, coil winder. And the same goes true with the amplifier. You know, I've got about, I'm about halfway through doing the, prog doing the programming on it. And, you know, if anybody knows when you start doing programming, things change <laughs> quite often. You know, and of course, nobody ever makes mistakes in programming. So, you know, that's not the issue. It's why ain't this board working right? It's not why ain't my programming working right? You know, so, you know, it, um, it takes time and it takes a lot of effort to, um, to build one of the higher profile amplifiers. Like I said, you could build that other amplifier in a weekend, maybe two, you know, and uh, gathering all the parts would take you, you know, whatever, whether your junk box is loaded or whether you're empty, you can go on eBay or call some guys up and say, hey, man, I need this, I need that, anybody got this? And usually find what you need to build it. But when you start a project like this, this becomes a project. You know, as you see right there, that layout probably took me, oh, I guess four days of moving stuff around just to get it to where I wanted it. Not to where it was operational, just to where I got it close. So I did all of this, got it all located, and then I said, well, you know, Henry and everybody else just hangs that blower from the bottom of the cabinet. I said, you know, it's always rattling, it's always making noise, it's always doing something. I said, you know, I remembered years ago when I worked at Southern Scrap, which was the junkyard, and they got a little bit of everything. We got teletypes off the USS Boston. We got amplifiers. We got URC-32s. And one thing I did notice back then is they were a lot of cloth plenums where they moved air around. So I said to myself, you know, I got a piece of material. And I said, my wife's got a sewing machine. I did some measuring, sewed it up, put it on there. I said, hmm, that didn't work. Apparently my sewing skills ain't what they need to be. You know, so I went to rendition two, and I got it to fit pretty well. I said, well, you know, this is going to be pretty good. I said, but, you know, it's awful flimsy. Said, okay. I said, man, you know, let me get some clear Krylon and spray this thing. Along with that, it's going to make it pretty much airtight, and it's going to make it rough, fairly rigid. And that's how that came to be. And that reduced the noise in it, I bet you, because I had originally had it mounted underneath. And the noise was about 15 dB higher. This way, I mean, that's a Rotron blower, which is not a Dayton blower. It's balanced. It doesn't vibrate. So you don't have a lot of mechanical noise as far as the wheels being out of, wheel being out of alignment. But you do have some vibration from the wheel moving. And that was where I was picking up some of the noise. So that was, that was roughly uh, my uh, moving toward the blower. Now, what you see right there is a choke. This is a choke input filter. So again, this is going to reduce your plate voltage out of that transformer to about 0.9 of the AC. You get better filtering. So at that, you get a cleaner signal. 
Choke input is always preferable to capacitive input because with a capacitive input filter only, you need a lot of capacity, plenty of it. And in order to get rid of the ripple that's caused by <clears throat> the AC. These are the two oil fill capacitors. Those are 16 microfarads apiece at 7,500 volts. Uh, they don't recommend more than 6,000 volts on those caps, but we're at 5,000 volts coming out of the rectifiers and a choke, so we're well, well within the ratings of, of those caps. Now, that tube requires 7.5 volt filament voltage. And if you notice right here, That transformer right there is just the filament transformer. We're looking at 60 amps or so. You know, so it takes a lot of filament current to run this tube. So the next problem I had was now I got to get this heavy ass wire up to that top cabinet. Well, believe me, I fought this every which way but loose. I looked at Henry, and Henry used a four-pin four cinch Jones, but wasn't rated in high enough current. I said, you know, that ain't going to work. And I wanted something that would mount flush, because that RF deck actually slides out of the back of that amplifier. So I said, man, you know, I don't know what I'm going to use for this. So I happened to be strolling through QST and look in the back, and power pole has a circular four pin connector and those are 45 amp contacts so now I got 90 amps because I'm putting two of them in parallel so I've got 90 amps for my filament current I said man this is a godsend so that is going to mount and if you look real close it's kind of hard to see there's a hole right there and there's actually a hole on the other side <clears throat> this is the filament side and that little connector is going to actually mount on a little angle plate that is going to be on the bottom of this chassis, right up in this corner. If you look to the, if you look to the right there, that is a 11 pin. And that's going to get all the control wires that I need to get out of the bottom of the amplifier back down to the power supply section. And the filament is going to be right over in this area here. So now all I've got to do is come from that, feed my filament choke, and I go to my tube, and I'm home free. Now, when I want to take it out, if I got to take it out to pull it out to do something to it, pull those two connectors off, slide it out, and we're done. There's nothing attached to the front panel. I don't have the only thing that, that's on that front panel, and it doesn't attach to this chassis, is the tune and load capacitors, the, uh, tuning knobs. That's and those originally were coupled to that RF chassis. But in this case, there's nothing there. So I pull those two connectors and about four screws and the whole deck comes out. So if you've got to service something, pretty easy to get it out, fix anything that blows up. Now, as we see here, originally that board up there was a control board. That was made by a guy in England who no longer builds them. I think he sells the boards. But that was a kit. And that was the first thing that was installed in the amplifier. I said, you know, I'm going to use this. And at that point, I wasn't convinced to use stepper motors yet. So this was going to be what was going to control most of the amplifier. However, now that there's stepper motors in it, that's going to come out. And this is the little bad boy that's going to go in there. That's going to control all the amplifier functions and everything that needs to go on in this amplifier. And everybody said, man, Scalise, you are fooling with microprocessors again. They're going to become obsolete. Yeah, true words were never spoken. That's why I bought 10 PIC controllers. <laughs> they are in stock. Okay. Now, when you look at it, you go, gee, you know, that, uh, that's got to be expensive. Well, you would think this board sells for 20 bucks from DigiKey as it sits. So 
all your layout work and all of that business, gone. It's all right here. Anything you need to do, you can put some little connectors on there, little tenth, tenth inch spacing connectors, and plug them in, and you're ready to go. And of course, my friend over here is, <laughs> is giving me the eye because he knows that microprocessors are not like tubes. You know? Yeah. Oh, they have plenty of smoke in them. And believe me, when you let it out, they don't do anything anymore. And you don't fix it. No. You don't fix it unless you want to replace it. That's the scenario. You know, so it you is. Headboard controls your stepper motors, too? Controls the stepper motors, controls your lights, controls everything that amplifier needs to do. You know, it's um, push to talk is going to um, go to a vacuum relay and an open frame relay. Vacuum relay is going to be on the output. Open frame is going to be on the input. So you'll always have the output will always be closed much sooner than the input. So you're not going to be keying the amplifier, sticking 100 watts into it, and having no antenna connected. That makes for fireworks and everything else. Now, the reason I built this amplifier and the reason I used that 3CX3000 is that tube is pretty damn well indestructible. The filament, I mean the grid, is 200 watts. Okay, it's got 200 watts of dissipation. So essentially you could turn your radio on, if you've got a 200 watt radio, put it into that and it's just a dummy load, it's just happy as a pig in shit. You know, it ain't gonna go east with the geese. 8877, you draw over 200 mils, adios muchachos. Another $1,500, please. You know, that's why you, they're, they're, the control circuitry on an 8877 and the protection circuits are much more needed than on a regular, on this tube especially. You know, this tube is designed for commercial service and it's designed to do 6,000 watts out, you know. So at 1,500 watts on FT8, we're going till the cows come home, you know. And that's the next thing. Yes, sir. It's also the best IMD in front of any tube I ever made on. Yeah, it does, it does have good characteristics. It really does. And, of course, he, he's been in the broadcast industry for how long? Well, over 20 years. <laughs> so there's the man that can tell you. You know, the, um, it, was a, it was a great tube, and the best part about it was free. <laughs> you know? That was back in the day when iMac, when you'd call them up and say, look, thinking about building some amplifiers, you know, and we need some engineering samples. And the guy would say, oh, man, what's your name? What's your company? Yeah, this company. Uh, okay, I'll send you some out. Psst. Three or four days, there they were. Now, you know, CPI, iMac's gone. CPI owns them. You know, and most of our tubes are being made in China, you know, especially the 3500s. I don't think they'll ever quit making, in my opinion, they'll never quit making 3500s. I mean, you know, it, it's just a tube that uh, has caught on and grabbed the foothold and it's staying, you know. And as long as, it, long as the Chinese can make money at them, and it, you know, it, they say that the Chinese tubes in the beginning were very poor quality. They, they were dying like flies, you know, but I ran a couple of them and ran them on FT8 and ran 1,200 watts out, you know, and not a problem. You know, they seem to, uh, they seem to take a licking and keep on ticking. And uh, <clears throat> anybody wants to look at these? I'll pass them around. What kind of... Uh RF shielding do you need to do for this? To not, not much because it's going in that cat where that board is sitting right now and there's an aluminum cover that goes over the top of that and they ain't nothing getting in or out. This plug with all of the external wiring that's come on, all that's bypassed on the back, 0.01s and um, little small ferrite beads. So most of all, everything that comes out of that chassis is going to be filtered. And there, if you can get RF out of that chassis, it's going to be tough. Once that cover gets on there, because if you look, 
there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screws on each side. Plus you've got, this is where your main RF is going to be for your drive and that is shielded separately from there. So, you know, it's, um, it's going to be tough to get any, uh, get any RF into that board. Any questions? Nobody? Mm -hmm. They said you couldn't get the resolution down. You know, on the stepper motor? No, I mean, can you now? Can oh. You get it to, you know, I mean, you the can scenario is you can, you, can, you can gear it. You can put, if, you, if you're not really happy with, uh, you know, I think you can get uh, half a degree, mm -hmm. you know. If you're not happy with that resolution, you can put a, a gear reduction on it, you know, or a belt and a pulley, just like... Um, Hang on a second. If you see that, see that pulley that's on the front, yeah. right here, you know, and that's an that's actually an idle pulley to, to keep tension on the on the belt. And there's another pulley on that stepper motor down there. So yeah, I mean you can you can you can have whatever of a ratio you really want, but I mean you know with an eighth of a degree, I mean unless you're unless you're doing uh, a regular tuning capacitor with a 180 degree uh, swing for your tuning cap, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, even that, you can you can gear down, you know. They uh, CAI made an amplifier, and they actually uh, used some Pitman gear reduction motors and two gears, and I think it was like 10 to one, you know. And it, uh, you know, it seemed to work just fine. And I, I'm, I, and I'm, that's, a, that's another thing I'm going to steal from them. Thank them very much. There's a little phase circuit that they had, <clears throat> which once this amplifier tunes itself, if I move one way or the other, there's a, that little phase discriminator is going to shift the tuning either way without having to change the processor programming. So it, it's going to have a little window of uh, operation to where it'll actually tune itself. And that's for the for best phase between input and output. Yes, sir? Robert, did you consider using what, an Arduino or something for the controller board? I did. I did. And my C programming is poor at best. It's been too many years. And basic, I said, you know, they, I pretty remember, pretty well remember everything in basic. Now, nah, they make a compiler for that board that you can program and see. And you know, I think, in my estimation, that programming in C might give you a little bit faster operation time and the instruction cycles because when you program in basic, I'm thinking it's taking a lot of overhead and dumping it into that pick that it may not need to. And I can't say this for sure, but I got a buddy of mine who is very fluent in C, and he promised to come over and help me get up to speed so I can, uh, so I can try that and see what the difference is. Because when I was programming the uh, call winder, I ran into the problem of instruction cycle and actually driving the stepper motors because the stepper motors were running really rapid in the coil winder. Whereas in this project, their, uh, their run time is really going to be minimal, you know. It's not going to be, unless you're going from 10 to 160, you know, you're gonna, your tuning time is going to be nil. But yeah, C, C I think would be a better program in the Adreno. I mean, it, it, basically the Adreno is a pick. Right. You know, it's got a, it's got a pick controller. Um, this particular controller has two A to D's on it, you know, and it will drive, I'll pass this around, it'll drive this display, take that keyboard entry, you know, and all those routines are already done. You just pull them down out of the basic library. 
And so you don't have to do much of anything as far as keyboard entry and display. One other note is, <clears throat> everybody's going to say, well, man, how are you going to know how to program this thing for where those inductors and capacitors have to be? Well, that, that thought crossed my mind. I said, you know, there's an easy way to do that. These two controls on the front panel are actually going to be my input. And what I'm going to have is there's going to be a push button in the top of an amplifier. When I first, first put this on, powered up, I'm going to set those parameters by hand and then load them into that microprocessor. So at that point, if things change, you can always go back to the band you were on and then go back and reinsert those values without having to pull a, pull a chip out, reprogram it, and do anything else that, you know, would, you could do this in five minutes as opposed to taking you an hour and a half to get it all apart, reprogram the chip, and then put it back in. Yes, sir? Have you considered using uh, scan interface to the rig? Probably do it with that board and just read the frequency right out of the rig. That, bo that board has a USB port and a serial port. That is down the line. But yeah, that, uh, that's something that that board could do without any issue, you know? At that point, you would be dependent on the programming to read what you had in and then convert that to steps on the two stepper motors. So it would be a, it, it's gonna, it would be a different set of programming. Anybody else? All right. Well, I think, that, think that's it for me.